right, hello, biology buckaroos. Um, today we're doing 6.4 speciation. We've been talking about natural selection, which is how species change over time. Um, we talked on Tuesday about um, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is are the conditions required to keep a species from evolving, what, what causes fossil species to occur, where they don't seem to change very much. And then we also looked at how we can determine allele frequencies based on percentages of homozygous recessive individuals in a population. And we did a lot of math, and I know you guys didn't like that much, but we're done with that part. No more math. Today we're going to look at where exactly we draw the line. How can we go from, you know, we have one species and now we have two species. Or we had one species, but now we're going to call it a different species because it's not much like its ancestors anymore. We call this process speciation. How new species develop from existing ones. And there's two main ways that we can say that this happens. Um, if the allele frequencies change enough that the new population is substantially different from the old population, then we might consider it a new species. Or if you end up with uh, different groups that end up not able to reproduce anymore. We call that reproductive isolation. Both of these methods can result in new species forming. And just for example of speciation, um, we think that cats are all descended from a single ancestor species. And so things like lions and cheetahs and house cats and panthers um, all resulted from different mutations and then they lost it and eventually lost the ability to interbreed with one another and now they're all considered um, different species. Okay, so how do changes in allele frequencies work? The allele frequency is how often that specific allele and then the trait it's linked to occur in a population. If you change the allele frequencies dramatically, you change the appearance or the behavior of the organism. And there's lots of environmental factors that can trigger this. Things like changes in your food sources. If you have to find something new to eat, it may end up with adaptations made to teeth or behavioral adaptations. Um, climate changes can result in changes in fur texture, density, um, size of the animals changes, stuff like that. Or natural disasters. Um, we did one example previously where we looked at how lizard colors might change after an ash fall, if the ground around them is changing color, um, or if there's flooding, you know, and they end up with a real wet, watery environment, that can trigger evolutionary change as well. We rely on mutations to introduce the new genes, which isn't um, super effective because mutations are completely random. And so whether or not mutations are helpful or harmful or do nothing at all um, is up to chance. And so gathering helpful mutations is actually a very long, slow process. But fortunately, the Earth is very, very old, so we have lots and lots of time. So this is just showing an example of what can happen with rabbits. We have two different groups of rabbits. They live on different sides. They have isolation, and as we're going to see, isolation is a requirement for creating new species. They can't cross the river, so they're isolated. On the one side, they stay white, but their ears get floppy, and their tail gets poofier. And then on the other side, they don't change form much, but their fur color gradually darkens. And so we end up with two very distinctive populations of rabbits. And if all of a sudden this river changed course or dried up, and these two rabbits could get to could uh, meet one another again, they probably wouldn't reproduce together, just because they, they're too different. They don't recognize each other as being members of the same species and potential partners anymore. Okay, so reproductive isolation then is when species... Uh, lose the ability to reproduce. And that is fundamental because that was really a key part of our definitions of what a species is. A species is a group of organisms that can reproduce and create an offspring. Um, if they lose that ability, they're no longer the same species. It is a fundamental sort of part of the definition. So there's three ways that this loss can occur. Geographical isolation, behavioral isolation, or temporal isolation. And we're gonna talk about all three of those. Geographical one, Geographical isolation is probably the easiest one to understand. There's something that is physically blocking the groups and preventing them from mingling. Um, a geographical feature. It could be something like a canyon. This is the Grand Canyon. On the east and west rims, there are populations of chipmunks that don't meet one another. They have no way of crossing the Grand Canyon. And so we have distinct isolated groups. Now, if we took them and brought them together in like a zoo or a lab setting or something like that, maybe they would be able to breed. Um, lions and tigers, for example, can breed in zoos, but since that's not a naturally occurring situation, it doesn't um, count in terms of our, our definition of, of not having the ability to reproduce. So yeah, so what happens in a zoo or in a lab doesn't really count for our definitions here. So these two little guys would be two different species because they cannot reach each other. And as you can see, they're not morphologically the same. They have slightly different color variations going on here. Um, same thing in the oceans can occur. 
when North America and South America bumped into one another and created the Panama, um, there's a land bridge here, um, 3.5 million years ago, it split apart the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And so these ocean fish can't cross the land bridge, and now they're very different from one another over 3.5 million years. Nowadays, of course, we have the Panama Canal, and maybe fish get through that. Probably fish get through that. And so these variations might be breaking down. We don't know. Okay, distance, just sheer distance can count as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be a river or a canyon or the ocean in between. Um, like Arctic fox to gray fox, um, they're not going to meet up with one another. Theoretically, they could travel, but Arctic foxes are so well adapted to the colder air that as they move further south, the heat would kill them. And gray foxes are the opposite. They're adapted to the heat. If they move too far north, the cold would kill them. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical, you know, a physical change that you can take a picture of. It can just be sheer geography. Arctic animals tend to be really cute because they have like heavy fur, short ears, short legs, short nose, and so they give them sort of a babyish look compared to like desert animals, which tend to have like longer ears and noses, which can be really cute too with like fennec foxes and stuff. But anyway. Okay, behavioral isolation. This one's, oops, this one's interesting. Um, most animal species, especially like birds and mammals and reptiles and fish even, have distinct reproductive behaviors. They have to find their mate and court them with songs or nest building, dances, gift giving, all sorts of different things. There's all kinds of different reproductive behaviors out there to make a partner accept the male or the female as a reproductive partner. Um, if, they, if the two groups are separated long enough, these reproductive behaviors can deviate where they're no longer doing the same dances or doing the same song as the other group is. And now if you bring them back together, well, they just aren't quite right. They're not, their dances aren't very attractive. That song isn't hitting the right notes. The gift giving is just off key. Um, all of a sudden it's not triggering the same instincts and they're not going to breed together just because they don't find each other attractive. They don't have, their, their behavior is not setting off their instincts correctly. An example of this is eastern versus western meadowlarks. They look the same to us humans, but they don't mingle. And it's partly because of their songs. They don't sing the same songs, and so they don't recognize each other. And, in, and again, this is a case where in a, in a lab, maybe we can get them to breed, but then the babies grow up with these muddled, mixed-up songs, and they're not able to find partners in either group. So, some examples. These are blue-footed boobies. They do mating dances. Um, some of them do like a side by side or maybe a pointing display. Um, but again, if they if they don't, if they if it doesn't look good to the receiver, they're not going to accept the courtship. Or if they are planning to meet on fruit, like fruit flies do, these like mangoes and these like bananas. Um, if it, that becomes a really strong instinct to where they're only on bananas or only on mangoes, the groups will stop mixing together. Okay, and then the third and the last one is pretty easy to understand: temporal, which means relating to time. Temporal isolation means that they're just not making babies at the same time. The same time of year, the same time of day, the same time of month, whatever it is. If there's, um, if they're not in season at the same time, they're not going to reproduce together. Um, some of these examples are kind of strange. Like salmon. Salmon have a two-year lifespan. They're born in rivers. They go out to the oceans. They grow up big and strong in the ocean. Then they go back to the river to spawn, and then they die. Um, and this is a two-year interval. So if a, an even-year salmon is one that's born in an even year, it spends the odd year in the ocean, comes back to a river on the even year. Same thing with the odd years, um, that two-year gap. And so the even-year groups and the odd-year groups don't actually mix together very much because they, they're separated by time. And if they eventually lose the ability to interbreed, they could be considered two different sp separate species. Um, same thing down here with some skunks. We have the eastern spotted skunk versus the western spotted skunk. Um, the eastern, I think, does a has babies in the spring, and the western has babies in the fall, or something like that. I don't remember this particular example. But again, if they're, if they're not in, if they're not reproductively active at the same time, it's not going to line up properly, and they're not going to find each other as attractive mates. So frogs, um, American toads mate in early summer, Fowler's toads mate in late summer, that's enough to keep them at separate groups. Okay, that's the end of the notes. Thanks for your time. Have a great day and a great weekend. Bye.